Do you consider yourself an auteur? Well, if you say that, that no. Auteur. <laughs> That's how they say with, it. With that, uh, with that kind of petulance, <laughs> I'm an auteur. <laughs>
and our life are made of. So if you have the courage to open that door of allowing to question that narrative, collective narratives, right. like the country's narrative or your own one, and, and because all of this is happening from the end of the story of this character, yeah. and it's a story without a story that is revised from the end to the beginning, as if you will have the chance to, as they say in the last three minutes of your life, that everything just pass, all those kind of enmeshed, enmeshes time, space, and that it will be, kind, and that's, that's kind of built. So there's no answers because I didn't have the answer. Actually, what I like <laughs> is the bardo, is the question, is right. that space that is permanently uh, changing, you know, yeah. uh, and reinventing. And that, that's, that's how, how it is, you know. And it was so interesting at this point in your career, you're hitting 60. You know, it's like mm -hmm. many, I call it the new 50, but that's me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I don't like to worry about it. But <laughs> there is always that. It's actually the year before you hit mm -hmm. a landmark birthday mm -hmm. that you worry about all of mm -hmm. that stuff. And so you're doing this now, returning to Mexico for the first time since Amores mm -hmm. Paris to make a movie. Why did you decide this moment had to be it? Did the pandemic have anything to do with it or just things? A, a, a break from making movies for a few years? Or? I, I think that um, the way I see it now is that I think something that had a big impact on me was uh, making Carne y Arena. Yes, which, which I was going to ask you about. I love which that. was a virtual reality installation about yeah. immigrants. And I interviewed 500 or more than 500 immigrants with really heartbreaking stories. And the way they open up, the way they share their stories and, and we spent like one year working together and the, the, how close we got in that sense. And beyond of, of, of the, your, the status that you have, bef beyond if you are in a privileged situation as I am, and not, uh, and, or, or an, another terrible situation as some of these people were, no matter what, when you leave your country, what we share was that profound nostalgia, melancholy, and the things that we lost. And right. be beyond, again, the, the, the outcome, regardless of the outcome of circumstances you are in, we share all that. And that, in a way, impacted me a lot. Mm -hmm. Because I have been seeing this phenomenon in three films, actually. In Beautiful, I spoke about immigration. In Babel, I spoke about immigration. Then I did the full work of that. But I have also always been observing and the marginalized and right. the people that live in tough circumstances. But suddenly I felt that I was impacted with the same kind of existential dilemma that we all face, which is all the affections and all the things that you lost and the things that you gain. And I felt that I need to be honest and have the courage to tell my story because every story of every immigrant is different yeah. no matter if you're medium class rich class well no it every story comes i said okay now you have to open yourself and and see why you are here what what happened i think that triggered a lot me the the need to go back and and find again those narratives and question those narratives that i and 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 this kind of public figure that you have and then our internal intimate life, yeah. that we, we are different with different people, with your pal or with your friends or with your family. You know, you, all, these, all these mirrors start to really be reflected. And it was super interesting and super profound and beautiful, you know? Yeah, there's so many interesting scenes in it. The one at the airport at LAX, mm -hmm. um, where you come back mm -hmm. and you sort of realize, uh, the character realizes, where's my home? And I thought that was getting right to the crux of it there. Did a situation like that ever happen to you? Absolutely. Really? <laughs> I have thousands this of is going through customs and Yeah, you know. yeah, because I have it uh, for all uh, I have just recently have a green card, but I have been here living with an O one visa and uh, and my family too. So uh, for like over twenty years. So. Yes, and, and I think that then I have a reckless driving in Memphis in two thousand three. Um for and after September 11, all the rules in, in were really tough. So I was stopped every time that I came to LA wow. in a secondary revision for one hour, one hour and a half with suspicious people. So every time that I arrived home, I was detained. I was sent to the other thing. And I can tell you some stories, but I will not bore you about that. And that precise story of the airport, as it is, 
line by line happened to my wife. Wow. She arrived home two years ago crying, and she was sensitive about it, and she just told me that story, you know, and, 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 and a guy did that to her, completely abusing his power with no reason to do that, you know what I mean? So anyway, I wanted to really just portray one of the things that <laughs> happens sometimes, yeah. where your identity, when you live outside, and you don't belong, it can be basically decided by a guy who had a bad lunch, yeah. and then everything is in a paper, and it can, cha it can change things. So anyway, it's, it's, that, it's that thing. It's one of the things that the film is about. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have to say, one of the great film experiences of my life was in Cannes, when you had the virtual reality uh, mm. set up there in a little airport mm. uh, and mm -hmm. right outside had to go find it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, it was like a hot ticket. It was really hard to get into because you when I got there, I realized, yeah, this is a very individual experience. I, it put me right in that situation that I'd never mm. experienced in that way of <clears throat> immigrants crossing the desert and the helicopter. I still remember all of it. I feel the sand. You know, this whole thing of virtual reality was so fascinating yeah. for you as a filmmaker it to go fantastic. that far. It was fantastic. It was, you know, virtual reality is everything that cinema is not, right? It, yeah. It's just a 360 degree, the people were barefoot and they could feel the sand oh. and you could feel the air of the helicopter and the body yeah. does not lie. Yeah. So all those sensorial things adding to the experience that you were moving the camera as you wanted and you were walking <laughs> with these guys. But the story of these people, and again, I think that you remember at the end there was these portraits of them, and you yeah. know them. And I told their stories. It's amazing, though, along the walls. I yeah. synthesized their stories and I put it in, in letters for everybody to understand what it takes to be that. Yeah. And it was simultaneously when Trump was calling every guy of us like immigrants are rapists, I, you know, and you see these people, the humanity, the courage, their circumstances, and it was, you know, and they had to in a way leave everything, including the, the identity. I, I will remember one thing that when we arrived um, in 2001, um, our, our, our son got into a school, he was a kinder, he was four years old, so it for him was to arrive to Mars, right? right. And we didn't speak English, so we put him in this kindergarten. There was an American teacher that she had a kind of, I think was from Guatemala, kind of an assistant. And I said to the assistant, oh, thanks God, can you translate to my son and help him to navigate this very brutal, traumatic thing that's only you are in a place that nobody understands you. Right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, I was picking my kid, and I saw the lunch completely untouched. His pants pee every day. He started lost, kind of his smile. He was not eating. So it was, I, I said, what's going on? Right. And 15 days later, I found that, that the reality is that she had not translated to him. And I said, why? Mm -hmm. yeah. And she told me, you know, because I don't want to speak Spanish, because these kids will think that I'm a maid. Oh. And I don't want to be perceived as a maid. Mm -hmm. And the, I will be the kind of denigrated. And I said, what you are talking about? You are bilingual. You own two languages. These are four or five years old kids. <laughs> But she was even ashamed to use her language yeah. because we perceived that. So in a way, uh, that's why I wanted to say about the, the officer that is in the airport in Bardo. Right. It's about that. Sometimes they need to reject their own roots and origins in order to integrate. They have to disintegrate completely and leave the past forever. Wow. And that's a very heartbreaking thing. You know, I yeah. was so mad about it and so sad about it because that's the reality of many, 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 many people you know yeah. it's amazing when you make a movie like that virtual reality I mean that is a whole distribution problem because it, it's you, you've got to have a special kind of place you can play it yes. and it's now yeah. playing in San Francisco by the is way is it I was wondering in if Richmond. it's still going absolutely yeah. it has been it play yeah. in Europe it play in Amsterdam yeah. in Spain now it's gonna go to Paris it's gonna go to New York now it's in in is is in is in Richmond and um, yeah it's traveling but as you uh, we did like three virtual uh, reality spaces. No, it's not one by one. Now it's three, 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 which is better. Yeah. But it's still, you know, it's 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 not a ma it's not a massive thing. Unfortunately, it cannot be experienced. I think one of the biggest experiences is that you experience that by yourself. Right. So that really put you in another kind of. That was the huge thing there, you know, because mm -hmm. you are by yourself and you don't know what's coming here, you know, in the in the field, the visceral feel of 
that whole experience yes. was amazing. I want the audience to become one of them and yeah. put literally, radically in the shoes of an immigrant. Yeah. And, 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 and I think what people has wrote in those books in every museum and every part that has been is so moving because yeah. there's something that is bigger than empathy, that is compassion. Yeah. And that emotion, which is one of the most high, um, I will say, highest emotional intelligence of that we can have as humans, you know, uh, and the most noble of it. Uh, I think uh, it, it really triggers compassion with people. And, and you, you, what I'm saying, you transcend understanding. Right. You become one of them. Yeah. And that moves your heart in a very different way. It's not only paternalizing and, and pity or sadness. No, it's, it's a transmutation <laughs> of experience. And that's what this technology, uh, if it's used in that way, can be. You know? Were you surprised at the level of success that you've had as a filmmaker? Because you really started hitting it about 22 years ago or so with mm -hmm. the Morris Paris. Mm -hmm. Before that, you were very musically oriented and mm -hmm. a lot of other things that you did. Um, did you see this never. as an ultimate career path? Never, never, <laughs> never. never. I, I'm, a, you know, I, I, I'm in a way in that sense, I'm autodidacted. I never study or, you know, I, I, I just watch it, a lot of films. I read a lot. Right. But I was not one of those guys who really study or make my film at seven years with a Super 8 camera and all that <laughs> thing. My, my, my childhood is blur. I don't remember of it. Uh. And, and so I cannot make a foundation of life. So in a way, in a way, this film too was a, a way for me to understand how do I got here? Yeah. You know, I have been working hard 25 years doing things since a TV sh pilot that I did in 95 to now, writing and producing and all that. But in a way, it, it all happens so fast, <laughs> or it feels that happens so fast. Uh, and that's what happened with the age, right? You start talking and suddenly somebody said, oh, that was 20 years ago. I said, really? I, I thought that it was seven years ago. You know, <laughs> time and space start so, in a way, the film for me was a way to clean the closet and understand a little bit um, uh, that, you know, but I never thought, planned, expected, yeah. never. It's interesting. Yeah. Do you consider yourself an auteur? Well, if you say that, that, no. Auteur? <laughs> <laughs> That's how they say with, it. With that, uh, with that kind of pet, pet <laughs> of, I'm an auteur. No, well, I think I'm a filmmaker. I think yeah. I'm, a, I'm just a filmmaker. <laughs> I think in a, as I'm a filmmaker, which in a way, you know, yes, all the films in a way become very personal. They are. That's well, it, you've got a filmography that's very, I mean, you're not going off and making a Marvel movie, in no. other words. Are that I have never, all the, all the things that I have done or that I have written or I have developed all. So, I mean, I have never been higher or I have, and it's not that I, you know, I would love somebody gave me a script and I said, oh my God, this is the best. <laughs> I would love to, yeah. you know, um, but... <laughs> I have never read something that in a way attracts me more than the right. things that I'm thinking about it. And, that, yeah. and I think it's important as a filmmaker to make things that only you can do. So the uniqueness of that, and I think as a filmmaker, young filmmakers, is, you know, if you became a hand for hire or something like that, yes, great, you, you practice your craft. But I think the films that only you can do with your point of view, your sensibility, your thing. I think those are the ones that we should do. I think that's what we need, no more voices, more the singular, unique uh, points of views of life, yeah. and not only the craft of it, you know? I think, so anyway, I have well, been lucky in that sense. What was it about Mexico now that we, you know, they call it the three amigos, Del Toro and you and Cuaron, and all coming up with this enormous success year after year at the same period in cinematic history. Mm. Is there something in the water in Mexico that happened? The magic water called mezcal. <laughs> <laughs> That's a liquid, the elixir of the gods. Um, that by the way, I had some mezcal yesterday. Oh my God, it's so good, but it's so, you know, it's 45% alcohol. So anyway, ah, well, there you go. This is strong, but um, no, I think it's, you know, that happened, no? Like there's generations sometimes, and it can happen in the Asian filmmakers and right. sometimes in the European. I mean, th there was, I think, uh, we come from a generation that 
because we, our country could not, could not provide at that time what we needed. Uh, mm -hmm. When I did Amores Perros, there was only six to seven films being produced in Mexico. Is that so right? So there was wow. no industry. There was, it was incredibly difficult to make one film. Wow. And if you made your, one, your first film, you were kind of the most lucky. And everybody that made the film knew that it will, it will be the first and the last. <laughs> and it was nothing. There was not seven films were produced that year. Wow. And it took a lot to really hit up. So what I'm saying, we need to leave. We need to leave, and, uh, and I think to have them as friends and mentors and inspire filmmakers, it has been, and share um, this, this job that we do, which is kind of unique, privileged, but weird as hell. <laughs> we like to be a bullfighter, you know what I mean? Like it's, we have to be a little crazy, and what it demands, you know, the, what it takes is a lot. Uh, again, it's not a complaint, but it's, it's, it's really kind of weird. So to share that weirdness of, of what we do with them has been a great uh, gift. Yeah. You know? When you say it takes a lot, I'm thinking The Revenant, before that Birdman. I mean, those yeah. were back to back. Yeah, and yeah that, that's the thing. That's, and that's one of the questions, a little moment of Bardo too, which is success demands time. <laughs> and what it takes sometimes, if it's worth it, you know, and, and think, so those questions are the ones that, that that's why <laughs> success is something that, uh, that, that, that's why it can be interpreted as a bigger failure, that people don't believe that. But I think sometimes uh, success could, could be even more, in, 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 I think in, when you fail, that we all have failed in a way, always you learn something, you grow, right. you, you go wiser, you go interior, there, there's, there's kind of that place that make you grow and see things. And success can be, in a way, much more misleading, you know yeah. what I mean, and what it takes, yeah. and, and things like that. So, anyway, I think, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it takes a lot to make a film. You know, you have to give yourself in every scene. You know, so I mean, physically, mentally, it's, it's really, it's really, it's really a, a very interesting job in that sense. You know? I was curious about uh, on Bardo. You premiered it at the Venice Film Festival, and then you went back and you took your time. I know there is so much pressure on filmmakers when they go to a film festival to deliver a film, mm -hmm. you know, and it seems unfair yeah. in its own way, but yeah. there is that pressure. I don't know if you're putting it on yourself or somebody else's or your distributor, but nevertheless, you go in and, and you yourself decided, I have not finished this film yet. Yeah. Or you see that. Yeah, I, I saw that with 2,000 people in front. <laughs> well, it's like a preview audience in a weird exactly. way. <laughs> exactly. and, and in a way, I was not worried because in a way, <laughs> I, as they said, no, pain is temporary, a film is forever. And I yeah. know that the film life is going to be for many years. So whatever noise is now, and what it, I, you know, the film will not be better or worse. I just need to take care of what I know I have to take care of, that I'm the only one who knows that kid. Exactly. So I know I knew I knew that I have to clean a little bit more, a little blood here, a little muckle here. You know, <laughs> I, I presented, and the people say, "Oh," because I felt that immediately um, I I have this opportunity to go and massage, and I left the, I left the film intact, with the same essence, right. essence. But I just make it a little bit thinner, yeah. and it was easy for me. I but you it. added a scene too, right? I, yeah, yeah. I, I just connect things. Yeah. Because my first cut was like four hours, four hours oh. or something. Wow. And okay. there was great scenes that took out, that yeah. I have to took out, because <laughs> they were great individually, but they did not help the whole experience. Yeah. Anyway, so then I did this last thing, and I was very happy that I, that I did it. Yeah. If I could, I could be still, you know, making it better as, as anything that do you, you feel do. that about all your films like you would go back and look at them yeah. uh, or like Ridley Scott I think he's still cutting Blade Runner I, yeah. <laughs> which I love the original by the way yeah. Uh, but yeah but what I'm saying he yeah. should not touch it it's, 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 it's an incredible film it's yeah. an incredible film that nobody understood at the time everybody right make a ridicule of him yeah and uh, <laughs> i mean it was so ridiculous and for me it was a masterpiece and it's one of the most beautiful films but yeah. what i'm mm -hmm. saying is um i think you yes i when i saw i never saw it but when i saw things i immediately said i should have take out that you <laughs> always honestly perfection is when you cannot take any nothing more right but it takes time to really understand it and yeah. it takes time and sometimes in 
you have to deliver and there's no time. You know? yeah. That's the reality. So yes, I think a film is endless. Yeah. It's an endless process. Yeah. So where do you go next? I mean, you know, you've had periods of three or four years between films. So you had mm. five years, I think, uh, here, um, maybe seven. Uh, between your last yeah. feature film. Yeah. So that's that's a long period of time. Where, yeah. What's in your head about what you want to do after this? I don't know. Honestly, all my <laughs> life, I have never chased films, you know. I'm not like anxious and I'm not one of those persons that need to go to work immediately. I, I really enjoy my life, you know, my uh, other life, let's right. put it that. I read a lot, I hike a lot, I had, you know, people that I really care and like and inspire. So I have so many things now to read and to see and things that I would like to do that normally I'm excited just to get out of, of, <laughs> of yeah, I did the film. That was a great thing. Then yeah. it's come all the promotion that is very long and it's sometimes, you know, it, it, it's, it's difficult to be explaining something that you took seven years to do and you thought that you, everything would be there, but then you had to really talk about it. But after that, I think that I will wait for a film to find me. You know, I, normally the films are the ones who find me. I'm not finding them or oh. chasing them. And yeah. what this means is in that space between one or the other, always something appears coming from somewhere. I'm, and I'm just kind of a medium that suddenly, broop, and suddenly say, oh, I like that idea. And then I started, and if it doesn't shake off, then I just start plant, you know, taking care and then a little seed. So, but it takes time, you know, yeah. it takes years and seasons for to be. So I think that that's what I, that's what I think supposed happen or not happen. <laughs> and maybe this is my last film and that can be great. I will be so happy. I mean, if, if I will have to decide, I will say, yeah, that's a great, this is for me, a film that I had the courage to make it to make a dream of a dream and a yeah. share emotion that I have with so many people about very universal things that we all share about fatherhood and about death and life and dreams and reality and fiction and the public and the intimate and the marriage and the things we lost as a couple, as a family and the things we like, that we enjoy, that we get. All those things for me was very beautiful that had I had the, the yeah, the, the chance was, I mean, honestly, I, I, I took the chance to do it. Yeah. And, uh, and I knew things and it's good to have uh, that opportunity and I'm very happy with it. I'm very satisfied, very kind. I felt kind of liberated, you know, with no, and uh, so that's a very beautiful feeling that that's what I'm saying. I don't know when I would like to go come back. You know? Well. It's a nice way to end if that's what, if that's the end. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, that, that, that's what I'm saying. It's not that yeah. I will see it. When it will be the next, I don't know. If it's seven years, maybe seven years. Yeah. You know, I think. Uh, but uh, anyway, any time that will, that will take is, is good for me. Very cool. Thanks for joining us on Behind the Lens. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Thank you.